Okay, um, let me uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Steve Kahn. I'm the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences uh, here at Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I asked Maria and some of our staff to organize this event um, because, to be honest, we were getting lots of questions from alumni and from donors and others. You know, what's going on with all this fusion stuff? <laughs> and so there seems to be a fair amount of interest uh, and the public as, uh, as a whole. I think most of you have noticed or probably noticed the press coverage uh, that came around December and January over the achievements at Livermore that we'll talk about in, in, in a few minutes. Um, we've assembled for this process uh, uh, expert panel of various individuals. Um, we'll introduce them in a minute. Uh, to cover fusion in a very broad sense, uh, starting with what is it, how does it work, um, why is it attractive, why is it hard, and what's been achieved recently, and what is, what is the path toward the future. Um, I think, as probably many of you know, fusion is a process where two light nuclei combine together to produce a heavier nucleus, uh, releasing a significant amount of energy in the process. Um, this is the process, the physics process that powers the stars. Uh, it's also the physics behind the hydrogen bomb. But the real challenge, and it's been a challenge for many years, has been how to harness uh, nuclear fusion, so-called controlled nuclear fusion, in a way that we can uh, convert it into a more usable form of energy um, without exploding the laboratory. <laughs> and so that's been one of the issues. Um, there are sort of two general approaches to uh, controlled nuclear fusion. One is called magnetic fusion, which uses magnetic fields to try to constrain plasmas and heat them up to temperatures where the nuclei will fuse. Uh, and the other is generally called inertial confinement fusion. Uh, where we essentially um, put a lot of energy into a, a, uh, a unit uh, containing um, hydrogen, or deuterium, tritium, various combinations, uh, and then get that to implode and therefore uh, heat up to high temperatures and cause fusion. Um, the press attention that came in December was due to an accomplishment at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which we'll hear about. Uh, that was in the inertial confinement fusion regime, and it was the first time when the amount of fusion energy released was larger than the amount of energy that was deposited on the pellet uh, containing the deuterium and tritium. So that was a breakthrough, uh, if you like, in the field and has given uh, significant uh, interest and hope that we're on the path to develop this into um, something that could be usable. There have also been great strides in magnetic fusion, uh, and we have someone on the, on the panel who will talk about that today, and um, a lot of um, investment from venture capitals and startups in attempting to harness both types of fusion to eventually uh, lead to uh, an important source of energy for the economy as a whole. Uh, so, of course, fusion is exciting because it produces clean energy. Um, that could be a game changer, as you know, for helping to solve some of the climate problems, uh, but also um, enabling us to move away from uh, fossil fuels and toward an, uh, a uh, source of energy generation that would be self-sustaining for many years. Uh, it's possible that this is a long way off. Um, there has been work on fusion for many, many years already. Um, the joke is to say, you know, how far off is it? And it's always 10 years off. <laughs> and so uh, perhaps the, the more recent achievements have changed that story, and, and that's what I think uh, you'll hear about a little bit. But it is tremendously exciting. And of course, significant advances in technology can occur relatively suddenly. Uh, there have been uh, tremendous surprises along the way in many areas of science. Uh, and this is one of them that's uh, perhaps on the brink. 
Uh, so with that introduction, um, I will introduce our moderator uh, for the panel, uh, Roger Falcone, who's seated, sitting near the front. Um, Roger was for many years a professor of physics at Berkeley, um, here at Berkeley. He was a former chair of the department. He was also the director of the Advanced Light Source at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, Roger's research over the years has um, been uh, involved with the physics of extreme conditions of pressure and temperature um, and uh, how that operates on various different levels. And since he turned emeritus a year or so ago, he's been actively involved in, uh, in looking into fusion as an advisor to various committees uh, for the government and elsewhere. Uh, so let me turn it over to Roger, and you can go ahead and introduce the panel. Thanks, Steve. Um, when I first became a professor at Berkeley, Steve and I, Steve just became a professor at the same time, and we had a joint laboratory where we studied plasma physics. So it, it, it all comes around in a circle here. Uh, let's see, I, we have a very distinguished panel. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce them. You have uh, copies of uh, a little more extensive uh, statements on their, their background, um, but I'll introduce the panel, and then I have an um, initial question for each of them. Um, our plan is to uh, essentially have presentations, questions by me for a total of about an hour, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. Um, uh, depending on the enthusiasm of the audience, we might extend that um, a bit too. So um, first uh, on my far right is Dan Kaysen. He's a professor of physics and astronomy. Um, he is also associated with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he's our theorist and uh, um, uh, here tonight, um, studies the basic science of processes, nuclear processes in the universe, and of course is very familiar with fusion and, and other processes, violent things that happen in the universe. Uh, the um, uh, right to my right here is Carl Van Bibber. He's a professor of nuclear engineering, chair of the department right now. Um, studies all sorts of interesting things in particle astrophysics, uh, basic and applied sciences. Um, he has served as associate dean in the College of Engineering, so he, like many great uh, and dedicated faculty here at Berkeley, he manages to jump back and forth between administrative work and then being a professor and doing research, and, and we admire that. Um, Kim Budil is, uh, is here, uh, second from the right. Kim is the director of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, part of the UC system. Uh, she sets the vision for the laboratory. Uh, she's a terrific leader out there and happened to be director at just the right time when this breakthrough happens. I think we can credit Kim with a lot of that, uh, of course. Um, Kim and I know each other from uh, student days. She was a, a, a University of California uh, PhD at UC Davis. Uh, and finally, um, uh, right here uh, is Rick Needham, um, second from my right. He's the Chief Commercial Officer from Commonwealth Fusion Systems. And it's really terrific that you could be here with us today. He has a lot of experience in the energy sector, um, worked at Google and helped direct some of the new activities there, uh, and now is um, connected with Commonwealth Fusion Systems. You've probably read a lot about that. Uh, it's working together with MIT, and we're really pleased that um, he was able to be here. It turns out he spends a lot of time on the West Coast, which is lucky for us that he could be here. And he, we're particularly interested in his some of his views on the economics of this whole uh, endeavor of making fusion power. So uh, let's see. Just to start off, I just have a kind of an opening question, which the panel will take a few minutes to discuss. Maybe some have movies um, to show, and they'll take five minutes. They may or may not choose to answer my question, but that's okay. That's their prerogative. So, um, Dan, what what nuclear processes happen in the universe, and how does that relate at all to helping us power the planet? Um, that's sort of a provocative question, but 
Uh, are we going to show the movie or are you going to call for it when it's appropriate? Can we call for it at the end? Do you want me to do the introduction? Sure, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll give a little introduction of the basics of, uh, of uh, fusion and the relevance it has in our universe. Uh, as, as it was said, it powers most of what we see in the sky. And uh, it, well, the basic idea is that, uh, uh, you know, in typical burning, uh, you're sort of creating bonds or breaking bonds of uh, atoms. And a similar process of nuclear burning uh, is happening with the nucleus, which is sort of a million times smaller. So the energy scales are about a million times uh, greater. And um, uh, so you can have a very concentrated energy source that's converting, you know, up to a thousandth of the, the mass of the material into, uh, into energy. Um, and uh, uh, in the universe, there's basically two ways to do it. You can take heavy nuclei and split them apart uh, to lighter nuclei and fission, or you can take uh, lighter elements and fuse them together uh, into heavier elements. Uh, and uh, the latter that we'll talk about here, you know, it requires really uh, uh, extreme conditions because you need very high temperatures to get the particles moving fast enough to actually come together uh, and fuse. And so in, in the universe, this, uh, well, we have a wonderful example of this in, in the sun. Um, and uh, the sun is a, a wonderfully stable nuclear reactor, has a core of about 10 million degrees. Uh, and uh, the strong pressure in that environment is, held together uh, uh, by the gravity of this massive body in this uh, wonderful stable reactor system where uh, if the fusion starts burning a little too hot, the pressure will sort of puff up the star and quench it. Or if it's too slow, the gravity will pull it in and speed it back up. So uh, an ingenious kind of uh, engineering uh, system that uh, unfortunately you can't reproduce on Earth. Uh, so we're going to hear about more creative uh, solutions uh, uh, that you can do in terrestrial uh, experiments. And sometimes there can be instabilities uh, in that process. So in more massive stars, stars like 10, 100 times the mass of the sun, they can sort of exhaust their fuel very quickly uh, and then uh, lead to you know, catastrophic collapse, formation of black holes and neutron stars, uh, and release sort of the energy that the sun will burn over its entire lifetime uh, in a few seconds. And these are you know, supernova explosions and other stellar explosions are um, what my students and postdocs study theoretically and with uh, you know, computer simulations run on uh, supercomputers uh, that try to capture these complex multi-physics environments that uh, are very similar to the ones that uh, they're exploring in the labs now. Uh, and so it's, it's really in these processes, stellar fusion and, and explosive uh, uh, fusion in, in stars and supernova explosions that, that the, the heavy elements of the universe, all the stuff around us was, uh, was formed. So there's sort of an origin story involved in all of this. Um, and so if you want, you can show the, the movie of one okay. such example. This is, <laughs> this is actually a, kind of an artist rendition of the type of simulations we do, and it involves two neutron stars. You can think of a neutron star as sort of a, a nucleus the size of the mass of the sun, uh, dense as a, as a nucleus. And here are two neutron stars orbiting around emitting gravitational waves and eventually coalescing and colliding uh, in an extremely energetic and hot uh, uh, kind of explosion and emitting debris out into the universe. And it's under those sort of explosive conditions that you have all these nuclear processes happening. You have fusion of elements uh, into heavier elements all the way up to fusing to um, uranium and plutonium and then uh, those elements fission fissioning back down. Uh, and so those kind of events we think are producing the you know, heavy elements like gold and platinum uh, and uranium in the universe. And so we're studying a whole range of phenomena like that to try to understand how this all plays out on the uh, astrophysical scale. And translates to Earth, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, it produces all the elements okay. here on Earth. OK, thank you. Um, uh, so Carl, um, you're up next. Um, so my lead in for you is, do we actually need nuclear power, either fission or fusion, or both. It's taken a long time to try to perfect these systems, and we know there are some problems. So will nuclear power, in general, grow to be a larger fraction of our energy use? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, so I think my um, thinking on that question, <clears throat> um, I think there's no question that we need 
nuclear power in one form or the other, <clears throat> at least one should work um, to get us out of the paradigm of um, sort of a carbon-based um, energy system for a world which is um, growing and, and many economies um, emerging um, uh, that, that have um, dramatically growing energy needs. Uh, and I think we're all very familiar with the, <clears throat> the, the problems of, of, of um, you know, the associated with uh, carbonizing the atmosphere and the need to sort of decarbonize the atmosphere. Um, the, uh, it is simply so attractive to tap into uh, uh, sources of, um, of, of nuclear energy, whether they be fission or fusion, simply because the scales associated with it are, are, are so vastly greater by, by factors of millions than chemical energy. Um, the, um, uh, and it's amazing to me, you know, as a physicist, not an engineer, um, thinking about the history of the, 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 the father of um, nuclear physics, uh, Lord Rutherford, Ernest Lord Rutherford, died in 1937. In 1933, said, anyone is talking about <clears throat> getting energy out of the, uh, of the nucleus is talking moonshine. And uh, literally five years later, December of 1938, was the discovery by Hahn and Strassmann of fission. Um, 1942, the first sustained nuclear reaction by Enrico Fermi at Chicago. Uh, 1945, after a massive government uh, program and uh, the, uh, a world war, a real cataclysm, was um, uh, sort of uh, uh, a sort of weaponizable nuclear weapons that could be transported and used. Um, and then by 1951, we had energy on the grid. Uh, fission is um, like falling off a log. It really went that fast. Fusion, uh, in principle, is very attractive, um, but it's been since the 1946 patent, uh, UK patent of um, Thompson and Blackett. It's been 70 something years. We're just now getting breakthrough. In one case, it's really an issue of, of perfecting the engineering and engineering discipline. The other is um, I think there are still some questions, a lot of questions at the netherworld between physics and engineering that need to be solved. Fusion is a much harder thing. Uh, there are several qualifications that it needs to have. You ha it has to be scalable to very large, uh, be able to produce many, many uh, you know, gigawatts um, of power in, in each region, uh, scalable. Um, uh, it has to be have a good cost model. I mean, our current fleet of reactors, we have to be very proud of, is about 100 in the US. Um, their uh, availability, uh, that, which is measured very closely, is in the 90%. They're on all the time. They provide base power when uh, there's no wind or solar there. So they're very essential for providing that base power. Um, they have to be uh, safe um, against all possibilities of, of, of various uh, uh, accidents. Um, and they also have to be uh, proliferation resistant. You don't want them, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the byproducts or the main fuel being misused or diverted for uh, production of nuclear weapons. Um, but it really is com comes down to engineering discipline. And as a physicist, I have very, very high regard for engineering. In fact, I would say two pivotal moments in my own life, you know, having been born in New London, Connecticut, to, to date myself a little bit. When I was about yay high, my father took me down to the Thames River and we saw the Nautilus go out to sea on its sea trials. It was the world's first nuclear submarine. And I was too young to understand that, but I understood that the world had changed. And then many years later, decades later, I, having spent 25 years at Livermore, was watching from the gestation of the National Nuclear Facility coming from a concept to a construction project, 1999 to 2009, and then uh, seeing it turn on, and then this wonderful thing that happened on my birthday, thank you, Kim. <laughs> so December, December 5th, um, the, um, every time I walk through there, it's simply awesome. So we need it, it can be made to work. The new generation of fission reactors, uh, these small modular molten salt cool reactors uh, are gonna provide much, much better economic model safety and uh, proliferation resistance from the old fleet of uh, light water reactors. And fusion, um, I'm pulling for. I hope it works. Thank you, Carl. Um, next up is Kim. Uh, so Kim, my provocative question is, what was the breakthrough at Livermore? And why is it important? How does it relate to fusion energy? And what's next? 
all in five minutes. Okay. So before I start, I'm going to address your point about how it was all down to me. Yeah. <clears throat> so when I became director, <clears throat> I said uh, I had a plan. I had a 30, 60, 100 day plan for the lab. So 30 days, figure out what's going on. 60 days, do some stuff. 100 days, I had only one item on the list. And I thought, well, ignition at NIF. We'll put that on. It'll be the second item. So on just about day 100, we had our first indication we were going to get close. We got a 1.35 megajoule shot. So not quite ignition, but 0.7. So like I said, the only thing between us and ignition was an unreasonable expectation. So there you go. All right. So I'm going to show a brief movie just to orient you to what happened uh, at Livermore. Uh, as has been said, this was a very, very, very long journey to this accomplishment. Um, started 60 years ago with the idea that we wanted to be able to create the conditions to study fusion in a laboratory. So, uh, you know, modern thermonuclear weapons had shown that it was possible to create fusion on Earth, uh, but not in, a, not in a form where you could really get in there and study the detailed physics or control it and use it for other purposes. And so uh, some very bold, big thinkers had some great ideas that have uh, finally come to fruition. So if we can... And here's the movie. And here's the movie. So this, oh. The, oh, there we go. This is the target chamber for the National Ignition Facility, uh, which appeared in the movie Star Trek Into Darkness as the warp core of the Starship Enterprise, which is pretty cool. So NIF is the world's largest, most energetic laser. To put that into context, the facility itself is the size of three football fields in cross section and 10 stories tall at its, its greatest extent. That uh, those folks are holding the targets we put in the chamber. The typical target is about a centimeter. So we're gonna generate all this laser energy and concentrate it into a very small volume. And that's the trick for creating the conditions that enable you to create fusion in the laboratory. So there's 192 laser beams at the NIF, they get uh, transported into a little gold can. The, the laser beams hit the walls of the can and turn into x-rays, which bathe a little tiny capsule about two millimeters in diameter made out of diamond. That outer surface of the capsule blows off. That causes the inner surface to move in and compress deuterium and tritium, which are in the center. And if you can do that fast enough uh, and symmetrically enough and hold it together long enough, you can get to the point where the fusion reactions start to beat out the loss mechanisms. So fusion plasmas want to blow apart, and the trick here is to create the conditions around the fusion plasma uh, that hold it together long enough for that process to begin to bootstrap and take over. So I mentioned the 1.35 megajoule shot, that was August 8th, 2021. Um, it had been uh, a decade of operation at NIF, we've done um, several hundred uh, attempts at these big ignition shots. You know, we can do um, these very high energy shots about once uh, every few days. Um, a true shot that produces high fusion yields, we can do about once a week. So it's a very slow iteration process. These targets are artisanal works of art. It takes about seven months from start to finish to create a fully uh, complete target. And those little capsules made of diamond have to be, you know, perfectly smooth, completely without imperfections, uh, on a scale that's almost unimaginable. So they are, you know, hand built and polished and assembled uh, to extreme precision because any deviation from that kind of precision uh, gives you ways to turn the fusion reactions off in the target. So buoyed by that 1.35 megajoule shot, the team began iterating on the design of the experiment, and we have a few levers, how you deliver the laser energy, how much laser energy you can put into the target, and then the specifics of the um, components of the target, and began a journey of trying to repeat that experiment and then begin to turn up the yield. And so last December 5th, uh, the team was able to uh, field a target we were able to turn the laser energy up just a little bit from, we usually shoot about 1.9 megajoules up to about 2.05 megajoules of laser energy and produce 3.15 megajoules of fusion yield. So the National Academies gave us the definition of fusion ignition as target gain greater than one. So that's target gain of 1.5. It takes 330 megajoules to power the laser. So this is not you know, wall plug gain of 1.5. So there is a long way to go. 
we can do one fusion ignition experiment a week. Uh, to go to an energy scheme, you need to be able to do it 10 times a second. Um, now, this facility was built to do national security work and to study controlled nuclear fusion. So it wasn't built to be efficient, wasn't built to do energy research. The laser itself is only 0.7% efficient. So there's a huge amount of technological headroom with modern technologies to really begin to address many of these uh, concerns. But it's the first time in history that a fusion experiment has produced more fusion energy than required uh, to initiate the experiment. So pretty darn exciting. Um, and for folks in the scientific community, a real demonstration of you know, the big payoff when you invest in these really enormous scientific undertakings. So very exciting. Thank you, Kim. Um, we just had this celebration of uh, ignition at Livermore, and I would, went out to, to see it. And Kim mentioned that it felt like an alumni gathering at a college. Um, there were people from the classes from 70 years ago who were, uh, who were there, the original designers, and it, and it felt like that kind of gathering because people have been working on this for a while, but it was, all, it was great to get together. Um, our final uh, introduction is uh, by Rick. Um, and my question to you is um, the world, many nations have agreed to spend tens of billions of dollars on a fusion reactor in Kardashian, in France. That's, I don't know if it's the largest project we've ever done globally um, um, to build the demonstration tokamak fusion facility. Um, what is, why is your approach at Commonwealth different and why do you think you can get there before this massive international project? Um, well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm gonna talk about a version of fusion that's different than what Kim talked about. So I'll be talking about magnetic confinement versus inertial confinement. And our, our version of this is a tokamak, which is the same architecture as the one that Roger mentioned is being built in the south of France, which is, by the way, I think the largest construction project in Europe right now. Uh, 25 billion, expect to be much more than that. Um, why do we think that we can do it faster? Well, the reason is because we're using um, there's two elements to what we're doing, but the reason we can be faster is we are using an innovation that ITER, which is the name of the project, did not have access to. What is that? It's a high temperature superconducting magnet. Um, that allows us to have a much, much higher magnetic field than what the project in ITER is able to use. And that's because it was designed many, many years ago, started construction in 2007. Um, the best magnets they could use were low temperature superconducting magnets which once you get up to certain mag high enough magnetic fields, they lose their ability to superconduct, which means you can't run a lot of current through them without losses, and so you're limited in the magnetic field that you can get. High temperature superconducting, other than just the name, higher temperature, so it, it operates at slightly higher temperature, but it's still pretty cold, like tens of Kelvin. Um, the biggest deal is you can operate those at high magnetic fields, very high magnetic fields, and they stay superconducting. So what does that mean? That means we can take what has been classically viewed as the least risky approach to fusion energy, which is tokamaks, which is this magnetic donut. 100, over 150 of them have been built over the last 50 years. Their progress has been more than Moore's law in terms of how well they are performing until you get to a point where you had to build it big because you couldn't have a strong magnetic field. And that took a lot of time and it took a lot of capital and that's what ITER is, a big machine in the south of France. With a high temperature superconducting magnet, we can build something that basically has the same architecture, the same physics, but at 1 40th of the size. So that allows us to build a commercially relevant architecture fusion plant, which is happening right now. We're building one right now, just outside Boston. We call it Spark. Uh, and it will show net energy gain online by about 2025. Um, that net energy gain we're targeting is about 10. Not, not just one or one point, whatever, it's actually 10, which means it's gonna be enough gain, which means 10 times the amount of the heat comes out as we put in, uh, that it'll be relevant for a commercial plant. You can then attach a power producing plant to it and it would make electricity. That's not what the intention of this first plant is. The first plant is to show you can get net energy gain and once we've shown that with enough gain, uh, we've been told and we certainly think that we'll be able to raise a lot of capital to go build the first fusion plant that produces electricity and puts it on the grid. Timeline for that is early 2030s. We're right now 
looking at sites for that plant. We're looking for off takers for the power from that plant. And we're looking for ways to fund that plant. So it takes a long time to build a power project, especially a fusion one, first of a kind. So stepping back though, I think we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but maybe it, you know, I, I'll try and make it as clear as I can. Why is fusion so freaking awesome? Um, it's because it is, it is clean. It is zero emissions energy, abundant everywhere. It is uh, safe. It has no high level radioactive waste. It has no chain reaction, has no chance of meltdown, has no decay heat, has no transuranic materials, has no chance of proliferation. It's scalable. People talk about small modular reactors. We're, bu we're building a small modular fusion plant. Uh, we are manufacturing magnets today outside Boston. Modules, 18 of them go into a plant. And it's also secure. It has no proliferation risk. It has no geopolitical risk. It's not tied to any supply chain, really, uh, other than high temperature superconductors. Uh, it, you can place all the fuel for the entire plant on it, day one, and not have to import anything, anything. So in essence, you're creating, it's just a new paradigm for how you think about energy. You're creating energy, you're manufacturing energy. The fuel cost is de minimis. It just takes capital to build a plant, and then you're making energy. Why? Because it's 200 million times the energy per reaction than burning coal. It's, uh, it's just, this is why it's in sci-fi, this is why everyone loves it, this is why it's so fantastic. The problem is it's been really hard to achieve. You gotta achieve star conditions on Earth. Kim showed that you can do it, right? So, amazing. Um, the question is no longer can you create fusion conditions on Earth? The question is can you do it in an economic way that provides power, power anywhere, everywhere, at a reasonable cost? And we, um, as we're building our first pilot plant, the spark plant outside Boston, we're getting very good um, indications of the, what the, it costs to build. Because, why? Because we have costs, we have receipts. We have thousands of vendors making tens of thousands of parts to go into a, a facility. So we'll have a very good sense of what the capital cost of this plant will be. There's another part of the cost, which is the operating cost, which we have some indications of, but frankly, you won't know it until you build it. Um, and part of the operating cost is the fuel, which is obviously, well, as I've mentioned, really de minimis. The fuel is basically deuterium, a form of hydrogen that you can extract from seawater. It's tritium. We'll have to see it. We're very expensive and hard to find, and it has a half-life of 12 years, so it's just not, not naturally occurring. But you can seed it with a little bit of tritium, and then you can breed your own tritium. Obviously, some engineering work to prove that you can do that. Um, and then we have lithium, which is in a blanket that will surround the plant and will breed the tritium. But you know, all that stuff you can literally put on site day one and not have to import any fuel. So we are focused, Commonwealth Fusion Systems is focused from the very beginning, not on a particular architecture. We've been focused on what is the most, what is the fastest way to get to commercial fusion power. And the fastest way, in our view, is to use the least risky approach, tokamax, and use this innovation called high temperature superconducting magnets that allows you to shrink it down and make it a commercially relevant um, architecture and plant that you can go build. Uh, we've raised over two billion, we're now over 500 people, and we've got the most aggressive approach to producing fusion electricity on the grid. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rick. Um, these were all great presentations, great introductions. I'm sure they um, seeded a bunch of questions too. I'm, I'm gonna start off with maybe just couple questions. Um, so with any new technology like this, the public has to be engaged. Um, if they are convinced that this is not a good idea, it seems to me things won't go forward. In nuclear power, we had Chernobyl, we had Yucca Mountain, we had Three Mile Island. Each of those had their own problems of contaminating in an accident, waste disposal, high cost to operate, and so on. And, and, and Switzerland and Germany are closing their fission power plants down. Um, so without public support, it's, it seems like it could run into impediments. And that also gets into the question of how the government should be involved here. I mean, we have billions of dollars of private capital funding this, and yet the government wants to get involved either in regulation or funding its own research in this area. So how do we get the public, how do we get the government on board when in some sense, it's a little bit like the wild, wild west here. We have a bunch of companies, dozens of companies, each with their own ideas. 
um, going forward, uh, is that all that's needed or do we need public support? Do we need government support? Um, anyone can jump in, but uh, those with the microphone will speak first. I, so <laughs> I'm not with the government, so I'm happy to answer the question. But um, <laughs> uh, it's a new form of power that, you know, it may sound crazy, it may, it may sound hyperbolic, but there will be a before and there will be an after, like the steam engine. If the fusion energy becomes economic and available, we will live in a world of energy abundance. There's still the challenge of deploying it. There's still the engineering challenge of building it so it's economic, but there will be a before and after. So should the government get involved in that? Well, I think so. As a taxpayer, I think so. Um, and frankly, the government probably hasn't been funding it as much as it probably should, given this is literally something that could change the way we live, change the world, not just our own country, but the way we live. Um, that being said, there are mechanisms of support. We've been working with most of the national labs uh, trying to make sure we're advancing some of the science questions that still need to be addressed with respect to fusion. That's materials, it's operating um, in high, you know, high temperature physics and how materials operate in those environments. Um, how do plasmas perform? What are ways to control those plasmas? There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on, but because of some of these innovations that happen, like the high temperature superconducting materials, you can potentially make a leap forward. Uh, but the, the government involvement is also super critical in making sure that it's an understood energy source. And we recognize this as well. We will do our entire industry a disservice if we just decide we're gonna go build a plant somewhere and not tell anyone about it and what it is. Why? Because first off, people think, oh, fusion, that's nuclear. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it does operate from a nucleus. Um, that is where the energy comes from. But the safety profile is so, so very different from fission. I mean, I, I was a submarine officer in my early days, so I've been in New London. I've seen the Nautilus. I ran nuclear fission plants underwater. Um, but fusion is so different. It doesn't have the same safety profile. And this is why we worked very closely with other parts of the government, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who just announced one month ago uh, that all five commissioners unanimously decided that they will regulate the U.S., will regulate fusion like they regulate particle accelerators or like medical facilities that have um, you know, nuclear materials or irradiated materials, not like they regulate fission plants uh, where they, the design of the plant and the operations of the plant are highly regulated. For fusion plants, it's just gonna be based on the materials you have on site, tritium and some irradiated materials. And why does that make sense? It makes sense because that's what the safety profile is. A fusion plant cannot undergo a rapid chain reaction that's uncontrollable. Cannot, it just cannot melt down. Uh, it, it cannot release um, transuranic material. It has no proliferation risk. I went through some of these, but it doesn't have those, those attributes. And that's why uh, the government regulators took a very close look. Because after two and a half years stakeholder engagement and deciding that this is the regulatory path that makes sense. The UK has also decided on that approach. Other countries are still deciding. So it's in, imperative that the government also works on this it, because it, it literally can change the world, but also because it's a, very important that communities are brought along um, with understanding with what this technology really is. Its benefits, but also how it would fit with those communities. And that's incredibly important and something we've been involved in in Boston where we're building our plant. Let me just pick up on um, something you led in with that question, uh, Roger, about public perception and uh, public support. Um, uh, one of the things to me that is so incredibly encouraging, um, you know, uh, being uh, chair of a nuclear engineering department, is that the current young generation of people growing up are just extraordinarily enthused about nuclear energy, whether it be fission or fusion. Um, they do not share the prejudices of their, of their parents and their grandparents. Um, in fact, uh, every year, the number of people applying to our department who want to get into fusion uh, basically is more than all the other sub-disciplines combined. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, something that, that was sort of emblazoned in my mind, I remember uh, someone telling me uh, several months ago uh, sent me an email that there was this remarkable young woman, a high school student in Sweden uh, by the name of uh, Jan Anstut, as a Dutch last name, but her, she's a, a Swedish activist, 17 years old, went to COP27, you know, the, um, uh, the Committee on Policies 27 that was in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, where they talk about the implementation of the uh, 
you know, the, uh, the Paris Agreement and uh, set resolutions and, and a very formal document, the, the wording which is very important, who at a very late hour changed the wording to actually include nuclear energy in, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the joint resolution. Um, uh, so it wasn't simply renewables, but it was, um, uh, it was renewables plus, plus nuclear. And uh, she became a press celebrity all around the world. And what was interesting that caught my eye is they asked, what does she want to do in the future? And she said, I want to go to Berkeley as a, as a student. So immediately, <laughs> and this is something that your department hasn't done, we had her give by Zoom a departmental colloquium on uh, you know, the, the international policy having to do with nuclear power and uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole thing of, uh, of uh, how the, uh, the whole agreements are, are, are going. It was just marvelous. And, and uh, so to me, that's very encouraging is the enthusiasm of young people. So I just want to add one brief comment on public support. So we wouldn't be having this conversation without decades of public support for fusion research. This was a really big moonshot scale, long-term challenge. We've talked about the ignition result as the Wright brothers moment. You know, this is, this would not have happened without that long-term view of the value of investments in science and the value of investments in the kinds of specialized facilities and capabilities we have uh, across the country. And so, you know, what's unique about this moment is combining that um, scientific might and capability with the risk-taking of the private sector to accelerate what we're doing, right? The public sector is slow moving and risk averse, um, but has this huge scale. And so if you can bring those two things together, you know, there could be fusion energy on the grid on the, I sure hope on the timescales uh, that you mentioned before, but if not 10 years, you know, 20 years would be awesome. So I think it's important. Great, thanks. Um, I, you mentioned the idea of the importance of research in this area. You're collaborating with the national laboratories. Um, Kim, you've been doing research for, for many years in this area. So I want to talk a little bit about publication of ideas here. Um, it seems to me to be very complex. Um, on the one hand, we have pro proprietary ideas that business is worried about. And I've talked to a lot of fusion companies that are worried about um, uh, basically the threat, th the constant threat of uh, their intellectual property being stolen as they're developing fusion. This is, this is for real. Um, companies don't always publish their best results um, for competitive reasons. Um, on the other hand, um, research into fusion that goes on here on Earth can benefit fundamental understanding. Dan, the kind of thing that you wonder about, uh, worry about, and and there's this constant interplay between the fundamental and the um, proprietary part, and then there's the national security risk that may be involved here. These are um, uh, there are issues associated with fusion that are obviously related to our nuclear stockpile, uh, and 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 so they're national security issues. It just seems to me that it's a a, a real in some sense, a mess. <laughs> but do we sort it all out? Um, what is the role of scientific publication or any publication or revelation here? You want support, but you can't tell people about it? It's hard. So does anyone want to weigh in on the, the use of, of uh, publishing results here? And Dan, if you want to talk at first about um, uh, you know, how this is benefiting fundamental understanding, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I would. Uh echo what Carl said about the enthusiasm of, of young people and students that are coming in in physics and astronomy too and working on some of these uh, problems and uh, understanding the physics involved in nuclear reactions and reactive flows. And a lot of our students that are, you know, come in training in astrophysics wind up going to deliver more or other industry companies they get excited about um, the, the commercial and, and uh, benefits to, to energy in the world. Um, and uh, and so yeah, the you know a lot of the work we're doing is is building fundamental tools and in, in innovating, um, you know, codes and simulations and other uh, experimental techniques um, that is done sort of in the in the open and published uh, as part of the general scientific literature, uh, and and then um, to some extent gets uh, uh, integrated into some of the other applications. 
and uh, you know, and the other way we were learning much uh, potentially about you know astrophysics and, and fundamental uh, physics from these experiments. It was fantastic to have you know in the lab some sort of conditions that we only see you know thousands of light years away. There's been experiments where they've done uh, you know built uh, strong shocks that are similar to what you see when a supernova moving a few percent of the speed of light runs into gas around there, and um, they've actually seen particles getting accelerated in these uh, complex shock regions, um, which is the process we think you know, cosmic rays are produced uh, in the universe, the cosmic rays that are showering down upon us. So we're learning a lot about uh, different um, shock physics and, and nuclear reactions, uh, and there's uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, interaction there and, and engagement of students and postdocs. Yeah, you guys um, don't publish everything. Um, neither of you publish everything that you're doing here. So well, we, yeah, but we we think the process of scientific uh, endeavor and the scientific method in publishing your results and being transparent about them are incredibly important mm -hmm. because the whole fusion industry suffers. And I know this because well, I was looking at fusion when I was at Google, but then I was an investor five years in one of the largest private equity firms focused on energy and climate. And when you look at the space there are many companies that don't publish their results mm -hmm. and you don't know what did they really get. They'll tell you, here's what we got. Well, show me, um, show me how another expert has validated that that's what you got. Mm -hmm. uh, and without that, you end up with companies that no one really knows what they've done. So one of the reasons I think, you know, personally, I think one of the reasons Commonwealth Fusion Systems was able to raise its large round, the 1.8 billion Series B, was not just because they they made the most powerful magnet in the world. Great, that is fantastic and can show a pathway to a small tokamak plant that's relevant. But it's also the transparency that they had in doing so. So they published the result, they published their, their physics basis in papers, in physics papers, um, well before they started advancing the technology. And why? Because they want to be transparent. They want to invite critique. Tell us what you think. Do you think this will work? Um, if, if you don't think it will work, tell us why. Um, we'd like to make those changes so that we, it will work. I mean, this is why one of the, you know, the articles in New York Times is like, experts say this will work because they actually saw the, the basis of the physics. They weighed in and said, this, this should work. Um, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of engineering work to do, for sure, um, but this should work. And we, we, um, when we talk to other investors, to media, to academics, to, to, to people who are thinking about joining the fusion space, ask these questions. And ask them how are the you know what results can they share? What peer-reviewed papers have they published? How do they compare to some of the, the critical conditions you need for fusion? Loss in criteria, which is like hot enough, long enough, and compressed enough. You know, if you can achieve those three things, you can achieve fusion. That's what Kim did. Like you got it hot enough, long enough, uh, which is very hot for a very short period of time, but it achieved fusion conditions. And if a company can't say how they're doing on that in a peer-reviewed paper, in a peer-reviewed way, then move on to the next one and ask the next one how they're doing. But we think this transparency is, inc transparency is incredibly important. Thanks. So of course we're doing this for national security, so we have to think about both sides of this equation. Um, and there's two ways to look at that. One is uh, part of our national security objective is to show the world the capabilities of our scientists and engineers, to demonstrate that kind of might technical might uh, and prowess. And the way you do that is you participate in the scientific community. I mean, just as you said, we can tell everyone we're great and we often tell everyone we're great, but it's better if we show everyone that we're great. And so this kind of result really does that. Um, although it was funny, when we had the press conference to announce the result, the first question from a reporter was, you know, you had this experiment on December 5th and it's now eight days later, what have you been doing? <laughs> I was like, what kind of conspiracy could I come up with here? It's like, well, we were trying to make sure it was right. <laughs> and we did, you know, we brought in an external panel of experts to look at the data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we do a lot of other things in our facility, like laboratory astrophysics, uh, to really build our skills and capabilities, bring new people and new ideas to the facility, and to ensure that we keep a very robust open scientific profile. Now, there are other things we do that we don't publish and we don't talk about. Uh, some are operational and engineering things. You know, we operate our laser at a level, an energy fluence level, that's well above what people um, expected would be possible without damaging the laser. And that's because we've learned over time how to manage damage in the laser optics. 
we don't write a lot about how we do that. That's a you know a proprietary uh, approach to managing that system, and and it's not essential to the physics results that come out of those targets. So so you can think about separating the problem into different different components. But I really do think that open science is a critical part of uh, both success in the program, but also the national security um, uh, image we're trying to project into the world. Okay. Um, I want to open it up for questions in a minute, so you should think about it. I'm seeing a lot of head nodding and shaking, um, so I, there's some interest out there. Um, but uh, maybe just my final question is, um, my perception here is there is a lot more activity going on in the U.S for um, creating fusion power. More companies here, even though there are ones in Australia and Japan and Germany and the UK, um, there are, um, uh, but the, the bulk of the effort is in the US. Is that something that is true? Do you see the international um, uh, nature of this business or is it something that the US is focusing on more than other countries? So there are companies around the world focused on fusion. I, I do think the bulk of them are in the U.S., and I'd say the bulk of the, the funds raised have been um, through companies in the U.S. Uh, but there are several in Canada. There's many in the, you know, some in the U.K., Germany, Japan, China. Um, so it, it's hard to imagine like a more game-changing kind of a thing for uh, a country to invest in. Uh, I would say we probably have an ecosystem that makes it easier to invest in things here in the U.S. Um, is one thing, uh, but I think there's also been some, you know, significant advances here in the U.S. Um, I'd say the U.K. actually was the first country to really um, think about uh, a regulatory regime for fusion plants that made it um, easier. And I say easier not because we want it to be easy, but appropriate with respect to safety uh, measures for um, people, communities, the plant itself. But they had the first path to um, you know, licensing a fusion plant, which will be finalized in the next month or so. And they have a, a you know, fusion center out in Cullum where there's like three different companies trying to build pilot plants. Um, but I do think the bulk of them are in the US. I don't know how long that will be. I think there will be other companies that are formed. I think Germany just had a few form recently. So we will see. Yeah, yeah. And like many technologies, though, it'll require global regulation, um, whether it's AI or fission power or um, other things. Um, we'll look internationally for that kind of regulatory power. So um, maybe we could, ha we have a microphone. Um, this is being recorded. Um, I think this is where we say, if you didn't like that, then leave or something. <laughs> but that's what they always say on computers. Um, but anyway, um, please use the microphone because we want to hear your question and have that permanently recorded. So, Maria, can you pick? Hi, first of all, thank you very much for putting on this program with such uh, high qualified presenters. It's really fantastic. I have two questions, um, commercial questions type questions. The first one is, um, is there an expectation on the cost per kilowatt compared to other traditional um, sources, you know, either hydrocarbon or, or fission sources, including the amortization of the, of the physical plant? And well, let's say the physical plant. I don't know about the research. Um, the other question is, and this might be um, focused towards you, Rick, um, how do private investors, um, how do they stay interested when the internal rate of return horizon or the time value of money might be fairly stretched out and therefore, you know, having that kind of an impact on the IRR? Thanks. Sure, yeah. I, okay. Um, so economics, good questions um, and an important one to ask. So first off on the, the capital costs, uh, we think it like the f cost of a fusion plant is really two general things. There's the capital cost and the operating cost or CapEx and OpEx. Um, with respect to the CapEx, this is a, a fusion plant like the one that we're building. Think of it as like a highly engineered aerospace type device that you're building. Um, it has some, some special materials, uh, but it's not 
terribly dissimilar from the kinds of, you know, maybe the materials you'd use in a spacecraft or something like that. They're just, they're engineered to be, you know, have some specific characteristics. Uh, so you can get a handle on what that would cost. Uh, the one thing that it doesn't have, that a fusion plant will not have, at least so far in the U.S. and the U.K., is all the additional costs from licensing the design of that of that particular plant, which, by the way, for fission plants can be on the order of five to ten years and five hundred million to a billion dollars, just to get the design approved. That's not to build a plant; that's to get this design approved, um, and that's why fission has been difficult, and why fission is the only power source to date where the cost has gone up and not down. Um, so we won't have that cost. But when we're getting back to the, just what we think the capital cost will be, uh, we think it'll be quite reasonable compared to uh, and similar to fossil-based plants and other plants. Um, so in the, you know, thousands, several thousands per kilowatt range. So not, not uh, much less than fission plants today. Um, with respect to what was the second question? Remind me. Time horizon, right. And why would a private investor be interested in fusion given the long time horizon? Um, we're talking about markets. You know, typically private investors get excited about markets in the billions. Wow, it's a billion dollar market. We're talking about a fifteen trillion dollar market for the capital equipment to make power generation. If you're talking about getting to a net zero scenario, that's fifty trillion, fifty to sixty trillion. Uh, these are markets that are measured with T's, not B's, and so therefore the payoff is enormous. The risk is high, but the payoff is enormous. Um, I think private investors are getting a little bit more comfortable that it's not the old joke of 10 years. I'm glad you said 10 years is actually, uh, Steve, you said 10 years. Actually, the joke had been 30 years. So I'm glad you said 10. Um, but people are getting a little bit more comfortable that we are on the cusp of seeing what could be potentially commercial fusion. So um, these are long horizons, but these investors and the investors we have, for example, recognize that there is a, there is a time uh, not a short amount of time to developing and building large power plants. Um, and that will take time to prove out. There's still a bunch of technology to prove out and engineering to do. But the payoff at the end is potentially enormous. And just imagine what's the valuation of a company that's producing fusion plants and able to deploy them all over the world. Um, so I think uh, you know one of the questions that was asked of Carl was what's the value of fission or fusion? You know, there's been some recent studies done by whether it's Princeton or McKinsey has done a report on this. What's the value of firm baseload or dispatchable zero carbon power? And the short answer is it's very high. Um, but the longer answer is like from the physics, or sorry, from the Princeton study, if you did not have firm baseload power, the cost of electricity to a user would roughly double. Uh, and it goes up over time because you're getting to you know higher and higher penetrations of zero carbon power and intermittent sources. And if you did not have firm base power, that goes way up. So firm base load power is incredibly valuable, uh, you know, over the next several decades and certainly into the, you know the latter part of the century. But but is it so reasonable to evaluate things on the order of less than a dollar per kilowatt hour? Is that a a back of the envelope kind of calculation that people can do. Yeah, it's um, so there. There is a, a measure of um, analysis that people use for levelized cost of electricity, and it's usually you know right now we're seeing it's in the range you know forty fifty dollars uh, a megawatt hour or four to five cents a kilowatt hour something in that range. Um, first off, that that measure was originally designed to compare similar baseload power plants. It wasn't designed to compare intermittent sources with, with dispatchable baseload sources. So it does not account for what does it take to firm that power? What does it take to deliver that power all the time? What does it take on the transmission system and the build out, additional build out you would need from intermittent sources? So it's, it's kind of a, it's a very imperfect comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is one that's useful just to understand what is the capital cost, spread that over all the energy that's being produced. Um, and it's not just dollars per megawatt hour, it's also the, the power density of what it is that you're talking about. Um, a fusion plant or a fission plant um, is you know, hundreds of times more energy dense from a land basis than solar or wind. So if you talk about how much land will it take to proliferate renewables, to 100%, it is, it's not tenable. Um, so you need a more power dense source of power anyway, power dense and land dense source of power. Thanks. Right. Yeah, um, Carl, did you want to add something to it or should we go on to another question? 
Okay, or Kim, you know? Okay. Right there. Thanks, um, great presentations. Um, sounds like Fusion is uh, absolutely great for the lay, lay public also. Um, sounds like uh, Fusion is gonna be like the holy grail for the coming future. However, I'm old enough to remember when um, with um, uh, Fission, they were saying that it was gonna be so cheap that we would throw away the uh, meterings, you wouldn't have to meter electricity. I remember when, uh, I think it was at Eisenhower, they had Atoms for Peace and proliferated, and now we have nuclear plants in North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, India, and that led to great things. So being a bit of a skeptic, um, what are, I mean, what are some of the downsides? I mean, what are, how can a country or a terrorist, or whatever, really abuse these plants, use them as weapons? What about the potential um, byproducts, not, not of the fusion themselves, but all the stuff that required to make a fusion reactor run. So uh, you know, all I've heard is, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But what are some of the downsides? And what are some of the really scary things that you, I'm pretty sure at Livermore, have looked at uh, as far as, you know, what at least we can tell us um, about the things that really can happen with a fusion reactor that maybe we don't want to know about? Thank you, all excellent questions. And um, I think being uh, cautiously optimistic but reasonably skeptical is a good posture. I don't know, I think that's good. Um, I think by and large, the upside dramatically outweighs the downside for fusion. The things like passive safety, right? If you, if you stop the reaction, the fusion stops fundamentally different than you get nuclear power, no high level radioactive waste, not no radioactive waste, not no need to manage radioactive environments in the plant. So there are still safety considerations. And I think having a credible, transparent regulatory regime and a really good public education program, <clears throat> because this is the other nuclear power, we don't wanna end up going down the road that fission did and losing the trust of the public. Um, it's very easy to get in a bad space when you're talking about things that emit radiation. I mean, it's just, there's visceral public fear on that front. Um, you know, you do have to think through safeguards for any kind of technology that goes around the world, either for sensitive technologies in the plant or other uses of the neutrons. For example, you're producing massive numbers of neutrons here. You know, you're not producing them with fissile material, but you could do things with lots of neutrons that we would not like. So you would still want some kind of safeguards regime that went with that to deploy these plants. So there are questions we should answer, but by and large, you know, those are all manageable issues. Um, of course, I think they're all manageable for fission as well. And I think, you know, in some sense, we've lost the bead on the relative um, risk reward balance with fission. And that's a challenge here as well. Um, you know, I thought the joke about Fusion was that it was always 50 years away from whatever day you're asked. So, so I don't know. We're making smart progress. Um, I'm really excited about the the efforts and the energy that's going into this field and all the private sector investment and momentum that's being generated. And I'm cautiously optimistic that many of these will pay off. History suggests they take longer, they cost more, and they're more complicated than we think when we start. So you know, I'll just use the facility we built, right? We built the world's largest, most energetic laser. The original projection was that it would cost a billion dollars and take five years. It cost three and a half billion dollars and took 10 years, okay? And now for this, any scientists in the room, the factor of pi is the normal thing you multiply your budget by. <laughs> turns out that was pretty good in this case. Um, but we also had to invent seven of the core technologies that went into the laser as we were building it. I mean, so it's just a remarkable story of overcoming those obstacles. So I would say, I hope we have fusion power on the grid in the next 20 years. That would be a game changer for the planet uh, and for our economy. Maybe it's 30 years, still a win. I would still be all in on investing in that. Um, but in the near term, building credible education programs, really talking about what the uh, safeguards regime needs to look like, really being clear about what the safety issues are and how they're being managed in a plant is just essential. 
And I, I would echo Kim in saying a skeptical view is the right one to have always, just because you need to ask the questions. And we see people entering the fusion space that aren't, aren't skeptical, and we, and we wonder what it is that they're doing and what it is that they're funding. Um, but on the safety side, you know, to be clear, there, there are issues with fusion, which is we have some irradiated materials. Neutrons hit uh, our plasma-facing components, and can they can get irradiated and therefore become radioactive. Um, the design of the plant is such that those will always stay uh, as low-level radioactive waste or lower, um, and so they would need to be stored somewhere. But they have half-lives that are not thousands of years, but like tens of years. Um, and then you also have to very carefully manage the tritium that you have on site, which is also radioactive and can decay. Um, but these are very, very small quantities of tritium. Like uh, we're talking uh, things that are in the grams level, not in the tons level. So um, those are very important things that we need to make sure we manage. But to be clear, there's no, it has all the safety precautions you would have in any industrial plant. Um, plus there is radiation, there is there are neutrons. So you need to be careful from a radiation perspective in the plant as well. But these plants, they don't explode. They don't combust. Like the, People have asked us, well, what do you do to protect the environment from the plasma? Actually, it's the reverse. You need to protect the plasma from the environment because you look at this thing the wrong way and it just stops. And what does it mean when it stops? It just stops. It's not a fission plant that has decay heat where you're running a fission plant at 100%, you turn it off, it's still producing energy at 7% of its max power. You turned it off, it's still making decay heat. This doesn't have that. There's no chance that it could run away from you. The worst thing that can happen is it just stops and maybe if it gets uncontrolled, it may damage some equipment inside the plant, but it won't. there won't be any damage outside the plant. But those, those other things, the irradiated materials and the tritium, those are things we have to be very careful about make sure we're managing. But to Kim's point, the, the biggest point here is education is going to be incredibly important because when people hear fusion, they hear nuclear and they assume things about nuclear. And this is not the case. And so it's going to be incredibly important to work with government, stakeholders, media, investors, everyone, so that everyone recognizes what is what are the safety issues, are we ap appropriately managing those, and making sure people don't run off in a direction about something that's just not true about fusion plants. Great. Um. Yes, my question is really for Rick. You seem to dismiss completely this huge European project, 25 billion, 50 billion, maybe. Is, really your, is it really what you say that they should stop it? Is it a waste of taxpayer money? Or could they adjust the project while it's taking place? to benefit from what you have discovered about man magnet. I, I mean, you, you completely ignore it, correct? Yeah, so I would, um, ITER is incredibly important. It's uh, resulted in some advances in how we understand um, the plant. Even though it's not operating today, it has resulted in some advances in the science. It's a been helping to build up the supply chain for fusion. Uh, uh, one of my biggest worries is what Kim referred to when she said they achieved ignition and five days later someone said, what's next? One of my big worries is we're gonna show net energy gain in our spark plant and people are gonna turn around and say, where's the power plant? Like, hello, <laughs> we just did something that's amazing. Um, and we know we're gonna have to deliver a power plant. We're, we're working on that, but it takes time. Um, so ITER has been an important investment, and there's a lot of uh, benefit that's come from that. Uh, and we actually have people on our team who've worked at ITER who have operated plants, uh, not just ITER, but JET um, and, uh, and other plants, other tokamaks that have been built around the world. This, this work on plants that are not yet there is incredibly valuable. Uh, it's been very, very helpful for the science in advancing it. I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not the person deciding on where where the government's putting its money. Um, there have been questions around that, but it's a, a question for the government to decide. We do think, at the very least, there should be money that goes into the private approaches as well. One of the challenges with ITER is it is like 35 countries are involved in it, and you can imagine a a large project run by a mini UN becomes very difficult to actually advance in a 
in a, in a way that the private sector is uniquely able to advance, which is build, test, learn. Build, run it to failure, learn from it, and go build another thing. Um, it's very difficult for, we talked about this a little bit before we started, about large government programs are very difficult, um, face a difficult challenge in running something to failure uh, and then learning from that. And so that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, and the gentleman asked, what's the big disadvantage of fusion? I would say the big disadvantage of fusion energy is it's not here today. And that, that, that's what we're trying to solve. I have a question about the long-term impact of this new technology. Suppose one day we have fusion reactors all over the world, in our backyard and, and maybe in the basement or building. Now, the uh, problem is that uh, in uh, convert the utilizing this energy produce, we quite often convert the energy into electricity and for use. And the conversion process is not 100% because most of the energy you produce is in the form of heat and light. So I was wondering what is the sort of a, a waste product in terms of a, a no, uh, heat pollution uh, and how that would impact our environment over long term. Yeah, so the, um, you're right. The fundamental thing that fusion produces is heat. Um, it actually produces high energy neutrons that then will and and heat, and those neutrons will impact things that create heat as well. So in essence, what a fusion plant does is it makes heat. Um, we will put then a plant on it that converts that heat into electricity in the same way that a natural gas plant or a coal plant converts heat to electricity through a steam cycle. There's other cycles that we're looking at as well, but in essence, you're basically converting heat to electricity. So what's the the heat pollution, it's the same that would come from any power plant. You need cooling for that power plant. We could do the cooling via air cooling, which is less efficient, but that doesn't require then water and uses of water to provide cooling. But it's also something that we view not necessarily as pollution because the heat itself can be quite useful. So we talk about electricity as, a, as an output of a fusion plant. But you can imagine all the other hard to abate sectors when it comes to climate some of many of which will depend on clean heat, not electricity. So industrial processes, um, manufacturing processes, uh, things like you can imagine like desalination requires electricity. Heat could be helpful. Hydrogen production, elect, you know, zero carbon electricity, useful. Heat can actually make that even more efficient. Um, you can imagine other things that would use heat, district heating. So you can use that heat for, for useful purposes and knowing that that heat is not from combustion of something, but from, from fusion. Good answer. Also, there are at least one company that is working on not using heat, but using directly the uh, charged particles that uh, are generated by fusion uh, to directly convert that to a current, to electricity. Um, we'll see if that works. Um, but I think there's a myriad of approaches here. Yeah, I think the, uh, Kim, you may weigh in on this, but the, the energy contained in the nuclear particles far exceeds the spectral emissions of a plasma like this. And so uh, m most of the energy comes out in the form of high energy nuclear particles. And, it, and quite honestly, if it doesn't, it's not fusion, which could get us into a whole discussion of cold fusion, but we're not gonna go there today. <laughs> so this equipment, this is a question for Kim. So as you mentioned, NIF wasn't de uh, designed to be an operational reactor. Um, it was designed for a variety of purposes, but partly to achieve ignition. So my question is, is literally what have you done since? Okay, <laughs> so where, where, is, where is the lab going? As you mentioned, there's a whole slew of engineering issues, and Carl alluded to these, that go from just achieving that, that breakthrough and towards something that's practical for ICF. And I know, I'm not asking you how to solve that problem, but more like what is the lab's role versus private industry or other, other outlets? 
Thanks, it was a great question. So um, the role of the laboratory in inertial enabling inertial fusion energy is that we have the only facility on the planet where you can do the physics of the energy producing source. So our basic path forward is to try to reproduce the experiment we did in December, but then increase the yield. And the facility, so we produced three megajoules of yield. The facility is rated up to yields of about 150 megajoules. So we have a lot of headroom where we can work. Uh, we burned a very tiny fraction of the fusion fuel in that target. Um, we have a lot of headroom in that, a factor of 10 or so in, in headroom on that. And then the goal is to begin to understand how we can simplify the targets that we use for this. Once you have a really robust igniting plasma, then we can try to take some of the artisan character, artisanal character out of the targets and may, begin to make them more practical uh, for using for science research, uh, for our national security applications and for fusion energy applications. Uh, so the role of the lab I think is really to build that physics backbone and to work with partners to lower the barriers to getting these targets to ignite. So we want them to be as simple as possible because it really is the cost of that target that's gonna drive the cost of electricity at the end of this scheme. We could build the component technologies that go into a power plant. So the NIF laser is built on 1980s technology and lasers have come a long way over the arc of time. And so it's a 0.7% efficient laser. You could build a 10 or 20% efficient laser with modern technology. Um, but there are companies that could do that as well. And so you know, I think there's a technology development aspect that will largely reside in the private sector. We may help, we may have ideas. We've built some high repetition rate um, solid state lasers that are more efficient based on diode pumping instead of flash lamp pumping. So we have some ideas that I think are salient, um, but there are things that industry can take over from there. I think some of the big challenges that both magnetic and inertial face in materials, uh, understanding materials that are more radiation resistant or how to manage radiation, high radiation loads, uh, in different types of materials, working on the blanket materials, the actual details of how you're gonna manage the tritium cycle in your reactor, those are the kind of things that we can really be helpful with. We have the infrastructure and the expertise to work on those kinds of problems. And so we're working to create um, what I think of as sort of a new kind of ecosystem for this research. If this is really important, I want every company that's working in this area to advance as quickly as possible. So I want them to all have access to the physics. That's very important because they really, if they don't have that, they can't accelerate down the road. And then the companies can differentiate in their approaches. That's how they'll make money. Different technologies, different uh, commercial approaches. But really an open ecosystem with many companies participating to build that physics backbone, I think is our main contribution in this. Kim, I'll just add, I, I, I know you are participating in this, but the Government is funding public-private partnerships right now, and I'm sure the lab will be contributing in a broad way to those. And secondly, the government is funding uh, research hubs in fusion energy that will be located at universities, private companies, and national labs, and I'm sure you'll participate in those too. We are, and we're, we're trying to find opportunities to partner with magnetic fusion energy researchers because there are common challenges, and we should really lean into those together. Um, there are a small number of inertial fusion energy companies, and we have partnerships with all of them. Um, of course, most of the capital that's been invested has gone to magnetic fusion, but that was before we got ignition. So I'm just saying, maybe <laughs> maybe next year there'll be more. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, Carl. Actually, I just wanted to riff on that question and point it back to Kim. Um, one of the... <clears throat> the liabilities of being an administrator is you don't get to keep up with the literature or the current, uh, but I'm at 38 days and counting down right now, so I get to get back to doing science. But, um, you know, in, to, to give IFE a chance, you know, you, the, the, you know, to be able to do this 10 times a second, you know, like have a stick of dynamite going off, um, as Kim said, you really do need to be able to relax a lot of the artisan quality of these capsules. Uh, some years ago, a concept that was invented at Livermore and pursued by the Japanese, um, um, uh, which would dramatically relax those requirements, uh, uh, is, was a concept, as a variant of it called, a uh, uh, variant of hotspot ignition called fast ignition. Um, 
you know, uh, hot spot ignition, you compress and you get ignition. It's sort of like analogous to a diesel engine. Yeah, the, the, the concept of fast ignition is that you could compress the fuel um, to much less a degree and symmetry was much less requirement and then come up with a very short pulse laser and zap it like a spark plug, much like a ga uh, gasoline uh, uh, engine um, and get the thing going. And this could be much relaxed requirements. Initial experiments were not promising, but I think the Japanese are still working on it. What's the current state? And I think Roger may know this too. I say Roger probably knows, certainly knows the literature better than I do, but at least one of the companies we're working with has a fast ignition based scheme. So um, what we haven't had is a really good facility to work on the target coupling for the fast, fast pulse beam. I mean, you'd like to do those experiments at NIF. We built a short pulse uh, set of beam lines, the arc, uh, to do the short pulse uh, injection. We're using those to do diagnostic techniques not to do that. Um, you probably need more energy. So we just, I, from my perspective, we don't have, have not had the correct experimental infrastructure to really do the tests at scale to understand how this will work over time. So I don't know if you want to comment on the yeah, state I'll just of the say that it, it is evolving. People are still working on it, but there's a whole field of using these very powerful lasers to accelerate subatomic particles, to accelerate protons and their ideas around producing protons for medical therapy or for particle physics. And that field has been working in parallel and now is coming together where the ignition part comes from creating a high power proton beam that might seed the ignition. So it's interesting to see that, that parallel development of a different field now is, is coming together uh, with the fusion people. Um, but it, it's not well funded right now, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I don't know if this applies to, I mean, it certainly applies to the Topomac. I don't know if it applies to the um, laser approach, but are the materials that are made, um, that are used to make the, the magnet, this high temperature superconducting, um, are those in limited supply? Is there a concern about you know, is, is, is it concentrated in one part of the world? How, how much of a constraint is that? Yeah, so the high temperature superconducting material is like a rare earth, um, uh, beryllium carbon oxide. It's, it's kind of this very specific material. There's, other, there's a bunch of materials that have exhibited high temperature superconducting attributes, but the one we use, uh, does have um, it's it's only come into commercial production really in the last several years, which is why it's a new thing, and which is why Eater hasn't used it, and we are using it. So it's only kind of just come out. It's um, we are actually scaling up that industry uh, ourselves as a buyer. Uh, we have scaled that industry up pretty dramatically already, just ourselves. Uh, Fusion is the killer app for high temperature superconducting materials and high, high temperature superconducting tape. So it comes in a form of a tape. Actually, I don't have it, I have it in my bag usually. It's just, it's literally a, a thin tape. It's a micron thick that you can put uh, over 100 amps through. Um, so it's kind of just fascinating what it actually is. And I'd say high temperature superconducting is one of these miracles um, that I, people up here in the panel may know more, probably know, know, know more about it than I do, but it is, fascinating that something can be like zero resistance, not low resistance, like zero resistance, um, which with such a thin amount of material that you can send uh, mega, you know, mega amps through. So, um, but to answer your question, we are, um, the materials themselves haven't been in high production yet, uh, and we're scaling it up right now as we speak. So there's nothing, a rare earth doesn't mean that it's rare in the earth, it just means where it falls on the periodic table. So. It's not that it's rare, it's just um, there hasn't been a lot of production of it. But we face this actually in other parts of the plant. Like people tell us, oh, the, um, the blanket that you're using, we, we plan on using a fly blanket, which has beryllium in it. And people's like, oh, beryllium, that's, that's very constrained. Um, there's not a lot of supply of that. But if you actually go talk to the people that make beryllium, they say, oh, well, we've got, and by the way, it's a plant in the US uh, or a, a place in the US where the largest manufacturer beryllium gets it from and says, oh, well, 
yeah, we have one shift working on that. We have a big vein. The demand isn't high enough. The demand shoots up. We can add another shift of like eight people to go dig stuff up. But no one's asked us to do that, so we haven't done it. Um, so there's sometimes uh, people get in their minds that things are constrained just because that's where the market is. That's where the demand is. But when you go actually talk to the people doing the thing, you realize, oh, there actually aren't that many constraints on it. You know, we would hope to actually get to a constraint where we're selling, you know, thousands of, of arc power plants. Um, but then that's a that's a later challenge. I was just gonna. First of all, there's no demand for beryllium because it's the most dangerous substance known to man. Um, and traditional applications of beryllium, like where you have to machine it, there are problems. Aerosolized beryllium is very dangerous and causes beryllosis, uh, which is a very terrible disease. So. So there would be a huge supply if you had a you know a safe application that uh, you could manage the industrial controls for. On critical materials and minerals, it, a huge range of applications in this energy transition are dependent on materials that are come from other parts of the world that are in short supply or where supplies could be uh, constrained. And what this means for the U.S. is many of these materials are domestically or sourceable in friendly countries. It's just not been economically viable. So if you put a demand signal into the system that's consistent and at scale, um, I think many of those challenges can be overcome. We just really have to change the economic calculus for companies to get into mining, refining, and, and providing many of these component materials. And ICF uses gold and diamonds, and of course we know there's tons of that everywhere. So. <laughs> Well, look, I, I think we've, we've answered a lot of questions and we've opened up maybe even more than we've answered. So um, what we're going to do is uh, please come upstairs to the sixth floor where we have a reception. You can bug any of these people with any of your questions that were not answered. I'm going to ask them about why isn't artificial intelligence solving this problem for all of us. I don't get it. I mean, we're at an amazing time for all these technologies. So that's my question to them. But please bring your questions. Come and uh, have some food, have a drink. Uh, thank you for coming tonight.